Uh, Meenakshi, ma'am, we are live now. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. Good evening, everyone. I'm Meenakshi Badera, an audiologist, speech language pathologist. And on behalf of Indian Speech and Hearing Association, I would like to welcome you all yet to another very exciting session of our Speech and Hearing Awareness Annual 2020. These events, as you already know, are being conducted pan India in collaboration with our branches, chapters, training institutes, and professionals. And I would like to tell you again that the primary purpose of this program is to spread awareness and to educate public regarding various speech, language, hearing, or balance disorders. So today e evening, for today's evening, we have What a blessed evening we had yesterday with so many dignitaries coming and giving their inspiring words, sharing with us a lot of insight. If you missed that, don't worry. You can still view us on our YouTube channel, Isha Annuals. For today, we have a very exciting topic. For, sorry, for fifth, before we start for today, for fifth, we have another exciting topic regarding the uh, hearing problems in adults. So please um, join us tomorrow as um, well. Tomorrow that for is. Today, for today, we have a, 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 a very, very different, but yet uh, need of the R topic. That is uh, interprofessional collaborative practices for managing communication disorders. And to host this or to moderate this, we have a very young and dynamic Dr. Gagan Bajaj. He is an associate professor at the Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology, KMC Mangalore. And he's an alumni of Dr. Uh, SRCISH Bangalore. And he is a famous fellow, has a famous fellowship from CMC. He's an associate editor of Jisha. He's a core faculty at Mahe Famer Institute and member of MEU KMC Mangalore. He is a PhD guide at Mahe. He guides other professionals for his, their pursuit to PhD. And he's not only an excellent professional, he's also an excellent human being. And his passions in the profession lies in fluency disorders, cognitive, communicative aging, teaching, and an inciting, you know, teaching learning pedagogy. So it's, an, it's a very exciting way of uh, teaching, so which we all must learn from him. Over to you, Dr. Gavin. Thank you, Minakshi, ma'am, for those kind words. I hope I'm audible. Um, yeah, yeah, and now I would like to share my screen, ma'am, yeah, yeah, to take the discussion forward. I hope my screen is visible, ma'am. Yes. It's very visible. Okay. So a uh, very good evening to one and all who have joined us for this amazing panel discussion which, as Minakshi ma'am said, is something novel, something which the healthcare world should move towards, something we should be embracing, something which is going to change the way we look at health overall and our service delivery. And that's why we wrote over here, are you tired of running from one healthcare professional to another? And if yes, then today's panel discussion probably is an answer to where our healthcare system should be moving as a solution, fostering interprofessional collaborative practice for managing communication disorder. And for that, we have our eminent panelists who have joined us, who have 
immense experience in the area of interprofessional collaborative practice and education who have joined us today for this occasion. And it's my privilege today, before we take this discussion forward, to introduce all our eminent panelists who have joined us. It's my pleasure first to introduce Dr. Siraj A.M. Dr. Siraj A.M. is the Deputy Director of Center for Containing Education and Interprofessional Development and Professor of Microbiology at Manipal Academy of Higher Education. A fellow, a global faculty of the Famer Institute, Philadelphia, recipient of several awards and key awards include American Society of Microbiology Early Career Award, an Honorable Mention Award, UNESCO Award for International Educators, an Outstanding Mentor Award. Sir is also a Fulbright Visiting Scholar at the Department of Molecular Biology and Infectious Diseases, Florida International University, Miami, and recipient of the prestigious International Fellowship in Medical Education. For the good, innovative, student-centered pedagogic approaches in medical education, Sir has received a Good Teacher Award from from Manipal Academy of Higher Education eight times. So that speaks volumes about what Dr. Siraj Sir is about. He is the founding director of the fellowship program, the Mahe Famer Institute, which works in collaboration with Famer Philadelphia. A great mentor, an eminent leader, and my own teacher. Very warm welcome to you, Siraj Sir. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Anand R. Sir. Dr. Anand R. is a pulmonologist by qualification and training and practicing in a 600 bed tertiary care hospital in India, KMC Hospital. He's currently working as the professor of the Department of Respiratory Medicine at Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, India, which is one of the leading medical colleges in India. His area of special interests are airway diseases. Sir is an alumni of JJM Medical College, Davangere, and Sage JS Medical College, Mumbai. He's passionate about teaching, especially innovations in medical education, a co-faculty of the Mahe Famer Institute of Leadership in Interprofessional Education. He is the coordinator of the medical education unit and the leader of the team, which, he has, which has brought several changes in teaching learning pedagogy at the college. He has pioneered adoption of various innovative learning strategies in the institute and has won Good Teacher Award at Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore for five times. Sir is known for his work in quality in healthcare and in particular accreditation system. He has been awarded, he has been involved in the implementation of quality management system in the organization and is an assessor for national international accreditation bodies. Has participated as a faculty in various conferences, training programs, and delivered guest talks in pulmonology, medical education, and quality related topics. Th with 30 credits to in, uh, in international and national uh, peer reviewed journals, Sir is a well known global personality, a wonderful orator, a great leader, and an academician at excellence. Welcoming you, Dr. Anandar, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Thank you all. Then we have Dr. Krishna Vai. Dr. Krishna Vai, professor in the Department of Speech and Hearing at Manipal College of Health Profession, and whom we very well know as our most dynamic president of Indian Speech and President of Indian Speech and Hearing Association. Sir is an alumni of All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, MISO, PhD from Mahe. I'm clean competence in audiology. So holds 29 years of clinical and academic experience across diverse settings. So has held several academic and administrative positions at Mahi, Isha, and Rehabilitative Council of India and various other national and international professional organizations. So has mentored various students for step program of ASHA and PhD at Mahi and is also currently pursuing FAMER Fellowship from Mahi FAMER Institute. He has served as an eminent speaker and resource person at several global forums and has to his credit numerous research publications and high impact factor national and international peer reviewed journal. It's a great privilege to have you on board for this panel discussion, Dr. Krishna, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Thank you, Dr. Gagan.
a hearty welcome to you. Then we have Dr. Animesh Jain, sir, who has successfully recently completed his tenure as head of the department for five years at Department of Community Medicine at KMC Mangalore. Dr. Animesh Jain is a famous fellow of 2008 batch from PSG Institute, Coimbatore. Sir had successfully completed his advanced course in medical education in 2015 and had completed his PG diploma in bioethics and medical ethics from Ganapoya University and is also the head of Manglo unit of the UNESCO chair in bioethics. Sir is the deputy uh, convener of medical education unit at MC Mangalore, also a faculty of two famous regional institute at Coimbatore and Ma Manipal. He's also a member of Southeast Asia Regional Association of Medical Education and several other national and international professional organizations. He has been awarded the best innovative practice in teaching and training of community medicine at the IAPSM National Conference in 2019. He has been a part of multidisciplinary team who won the award, Manita Award in 2019. And these are just some of the awards among many others which Sir uh, has to his credit. Sir is a founding executive editor of Annals of Community Health, editor of WebMed Central and founding associate editor of Manipal Journal of Medical Sciences, besides being a reviewer of several reputed journals. It's a great privilege to have you with us today, Sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Gagan. Thank you. And then we have Dr. Harihara Prakash. Dr. Harihara is principal and professor of the Department of Physiotherapy at KM Patel Institute of Physiotherapy, Bhaikaka University. Dr. Harihara has completed his undergraduation from Pondicherry Central University and completed uh, his PG from Dr. MGR Medical University, Tamil Nadu, and has completed his doctorate in physical therapy from Spain in 2015. Sir, Dr. Harihara is also a famous fellow in IPE from Mahe Famer Institute, and has also finished his postgraduate diploma in osteopathy and critical practice. He's a recognized PhD guide at Bhaikaka University, an adjunct faculty at Mahe, Hefimer Institute and clinical director of Pit Feed program, Special Olympics member, a NAC peer team member for accreditation of colleges. Dr. Harihara has several awards to his credit, like Rashtri Vidya Saraswati Puraskar Award, IAP Oration Award, Award for Academic Excellence from Rajasthani Physiotherapy Association. He is editorial member and peer reviewer of several globally indexed journals, and it's a great privilege to have you with us today, Dr. Harihara. A hearty welcome to you. Thank you, Dr. Gagan and uh, the team of Asia. And nice to see all my mentors over here. I wish the program a great success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A very hearty welcome once again to all our panelists as we take this discussion forward. Taking this discussion forward, we would be first going through one clinical context. So let us all get into this clinical context. And for the next few minutes, let's imagine and take us take ourselves to a, a ward of a multi-speciality hospital where Mr. Prabhakaran has been admitted after he has got a stroke one week ago. So he's undergoing stroke rehabilitation over here. And then this is one fine day after one week when Mr. Prabhakaran has stayed in this hospital. And this is nine o'clock in the morning when the physician comes and meets Mr. Prabhakaran. Mrs. Prabhakaran asks the physician, doctor, when will he start walking, talking and eating like before? I cannot see him like this anymore. Doctor says, I have informed you before about the effect of stroke on his brain. His recovery will take time. Are the physiotherapists, occupation therapists, and speech language pathologists not coming for therapy? What are they saying? And then 10 o'clock, the nurse comes and Mrs. Prabhakaran says, but the doctor had told to stop this medicine from today. And the nurse says, I'm unaware of any such instruction, madam. Maybe the nurse on night duty knows about it. 
at 11 o'clock, a speech language pathologist visits Mr. Prabhakaran for dysphagia therapy. And Mrs. Prabhakaran asks her, the dietitian told us to give him chapati from today. And the speech language, language pathologist says, no, his oromotor system is not yet ready for solids. I cannot give him chapati. He may choke. Then it's 12 o'clock when the food and nutrition specialist visits Mr. Prabhakar and says, how many chapati did you eat today, Mr. Prabhakar? And Mrs. Prabhakar is amazed because she says, the speech therapist said that he is not ready for chapati. He may choke. I mean, why is there so much confusion? Why don't you talk to the speech language pathologist and decide if chapati should be given or no? And then is two o'clock occupation therapy time. When Mrs. Prabhakaran is telling the occupation therapist, he's too tired today to do these exercises. And the occupation therapist reply is, but I have been asked to do so, ma'am. I cannot help it. I have to go ahead and do it. Then comes the physiotherapist. And Mrs. Prabhakaran says, how are these exercises different from what the other person just did? Why so many of you come? And the physiotherapist says, Madam, you won't be able to understand these technical things. Please make him do these exercises. And then it's four o'clock in the evening. Speech language pathologist is again visiting. And Mrs. Prabhakaran is very worryingly asking her. When will he be able to speak like before? He's just not improving. And the speech language pathologist says, Madam, look, he's always too fatigued after the physiotherapy. Always I am coming after physiotherapy and he's too fatigued. So he needs to cooperate with me for speech therapy for me to show some progress. After receiving all these replies throughout the day, here is Mrs. Prabhakar and wondering, it has been so many days here. Nobody tells clearly when can we go home. I'm worried about my hospital bill. And all what Mr. Prabhakaran can say looking at all this is home. Home. Dear participants, I, I, I'm sure that many of us today reflect on this scenario relate to this scenario, put ourselves into the shoes of Mr. and Mrs. Prabhakaran and understand that as a patient, we have roamed from one healthcare professional to another, whether it is assessment of hearing loss, whether it is early intervention of hearing loss. When we visit one professional, learn something else, be a messenger, carry the information to another professional, Half the information we don't understand, half the information goes missing in between. And by the time we communicate, another decision has been taken for our health. So today, when we are on both sides of the table as a professional and as a patient, we know that when the interprofessional team or when a professional team of healthcare workers has not worked in cohesion, with each other. Ultimately, as a patient, I am on a receiving end. And I'm wondering always, I wish they all could talk to each other. I wish they all could meet each other. So I'm, I'm sure this situation has put us in the present context of this panel discussion as we take it forward with our first panelist for the day, Dr. Siraj, sir. sir we would like to know from you, what actually is interprofessional collaborative practice? Hello and uh, good evening everyone. Uh, at the outset, uh, thank you Gagan for that uh, wonderful introduction and uh, Honorable President of Isha, uh, Dr. Krishna, uh, other uh, office bearers and uh, participants who are present today, uh, thank you for being here today. 
to share some of the thoughts that we have uh, in the context of uh, what Gagan very clearly elucidated uh, on Prabhagaran's, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Prabhagaran. Well, uh, uh, on a lighter note, chapati is probably, okay, uh, would have been added to give more flavor to this case, but uh, may sound a bit trivial, but we understand that when it comes to our own problems, how difficult uh, we are, uh, you know, if any put into the patient's shoes and uh, uh, the hope only lies at home. So uh, it nicely summed up uh, with, with uh, the reason to go home and uh, very uh, clearly mentioned on different aspects of it, which we are going to deal today uh, in this session on interprofessional collaborative practice. Well, uh, Gagan, you asked me basically what is uh, interprofessional collaborative practice. So I would begin with collaboration as such, you know. <clears throat> collaboration basically uh, is a term that uh, we use in our day to day practice. But uh, we all know, you know, you don't need to be a health professional for that. It's basically a relationship. Collaboration, like, uh, you know, uh, many other important things when you have a team, uh, is a relationship. But it's a well-defined relationship, and uh, you see, you know, uh, different partners in that. And in this well-defined relationship, it is expected to be mutually beneficial, right? Now, uh, what is important when it comes uh, to a collaboration and you know a, a partnership when it comes to healthcare delivery is that uh, uh, the commitment, you know, the commitment regarding that, and we know that for this commitment. Uh, there is shared responsibility, there is mutual authority and accountability, most importantly, accountability and all these things are, you know, uh, centered uh, in patient care. So patient at the center of the entire event, uh, and that is how you relate it uh, to interprofessional collaboration in practice. Now, uh, I will uh, begin with how WHO puts, um, uh, you know, collaborative practice in healthcare. Uh, because many of you here uh, uh, probably not aware about uh, interprofessional collaborative practice happening or, you know, defined as an entirely separate entity. Uh, collaborative practice in healthcare occurs when multiple health workers, you have seen in this uh, specific scenario, uh, multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds provide comprehensive services. So collaborative practice, I, I, I define it uh, based on how WHO has put it. Uh, uh, collaborative practice in healthcare occurs when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds provide comprehensive services. So till now what we saw in terms of what Gagan showed us uh, it looks good. Uh, there are multiple health workers. The physio is there. The speech language pathologist is there. Uh, the the uh, the physician is there. The nutritionist is there. okay. Let's see where are we deviating. Okay, so multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds. Let me go to the second part of this definition. Provide comprehensive services by working with patients, the their families caregivers and communities to deliver the highest quality of care across the settings. And that is where the definition finds it difficult to gel with the scenario that Gagan very nicely put across. Collaborative practice in healthcare occurs when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds provide comprehensive services. After that, it's a full stop for us, or at least a coma. And that coma often results in patient landing up in coma, you know? So that, that is the truth, because when you talk to people, they say, look, we, we do it together. We, we, have you seen that, you know, we refer to so-and-so, we, we, our services are very comprehensive, but by definition, if you look, have you worked with the patients? Patient-centric care or patient-centeredness is central to collaborative care. So where is the patient? 
as one of our mentor often keeps asking, you know, where is the patient? You know, in terms of the care, where have you kept the patient? Have you kept their families informed? Are caregivers in picture? Have you given them clear cut guidelines? You know, and most importantly, are we delivering highest quality of care across settings? I'm worried only my discipline and why I'm not achieving because X has come before. And that is the reason why, you know, this person cannot get into this intervention or is finding it difficult or it is fatigued. Now, why do or why is it that we don't get time to come together and to see what can be provided in the interest of the patient? So that means different healthcare providers are applying their unique skills and knowledge to the management of patient. It's not that, you know, you just come and compromise on certain things. No. Collaboration is happening when these people have mutual respect for one another and one another's professions and are willing participants in a cooperative atmosphere. So that is where it actually deviates from an interdisciplinary approach, a multidisciplinary approach. That's what people usually say, you know. But if you want to provide comprehensive care, and if you want to see that roles of these professionals are clarified to get the best health outcomes or to enhance health outcomes, then we should be talking about interprofessional collaborative practice. Now, many in many of our countries, the healthcare systems are completely fragmented and unable to meet the healthcare needs of the population. Not only in India, even in developed nations, they have not been able to achieve this. Now, if you look at that, uh, this is a global phenomenon. So, when you, when you need to have interprofessional collaborative practice, it's also important to address education, at least certain aspects in an interprofessional way. Because if you expect these professionals or you know, from you know, diverse disciplines to work together, there should be some amount of learning that is happening together when students from two or more professions learn about from and with each other. I repeat, learn about from and with each other. So as a speech with a uh, language pathologist, I would like to know as a medical student, what are you doing you know, with this uh, uh, patient who has these problems or difficulties? What are you doing? You know, uh, Of course, it's, it doesn't end there. The medical student is curious to know that as a speech language pathologist student, what is it that you do? So Interprofessional education is important. Expecting people to do practice all of a sudden together or interprofessional collaborative practice to happen, you know, one fine morning uh, is, uh, is, is being very foolish, you know. So that is what we are advocating, you know. Uh, we, in the sense, most of the panelists here today are a part of a movement known as Interprofessional Education and Practice, where we have an institute in Manipal, where we train healthcare professionals and, of course, uh, you know, uh, health uh, professions educators on interprofessional education. So these are the tenets of interprofessional collaborative practice, and there are different competencies associated with, which I'm not going to discuss because this is not an academic crowd as such to talk in detail about it. But I hope I have answered your question, uh, Gagan, what is interprofessional collaborative practice? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for making us understand this concept of interprofessional collaborative practice. Uh, just to get into a little bit more depth of it, sir, we are very curious to know that what are going to be the benefits of such a collaborative practice for various stakeholders? I mean, what benefits are, it, uh, are these interprofessional collaborative practices going to offer to uh, professionals and patients? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, Gagan, uh... Well, uh, I must say that before we talk about these things, uh, it's the World Health Organization that has been the first proponent or, or people who have been supporting interprofessional education and practice, basically, because 
uh, systematic studies done for nearly six decades, I must say, uh, in a very, uh, as I told you, systematic fashion and scientifically has provided us evidence that this works, you know, especially uh, in three important aspects. Number one is the quality of care. You saw how Prabhagaran's or Mr. Prabhagaran had uh, uh, a very compromised quality of care. And I would say that this was not intentional. Everyone wanted to give their best, but it did not happen. Quality of care. Now, second aspect is the safety. You can relate it to, you know, the chapati or the exercise or whatever it is, but the safety uh, part of it, how safety becomes compromised. And third, and perhaps most important for, you know, countries like India is also I heard uh, Mrs. Prabhagaran worrying about the, the bill that she has to pay. So cost. So if you look at a fragmented healthcare delivery or the system that, you know, is totally fragmented, it actually has effects or bearing on quality of care, safety, and of course, cost. So we should remember that these are the three important things. Now coming to benefits per se, it improves patient care and outcomes. And this, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It has been already done. You know, uh, you saw a very good example of how the person has to move from place, from different places to, you know, and seeing different consultants. But interestingly, if uh, as participants of this webinar, if you would have noticed, one of the most important that was lacking among these uh, professionals was, you know, communication issues. So I would say that it helps to have hospital communication technology or let's say healthcare communication technology that lets care teams communicate and collaborate seamlessly and securely on the go or at the point of care, you know? So it can be you talking actually the voice Nowadays, of course, you might say using a text or video or whatever it is. Second, as I told you, the benefit is the reduced medical errors. You know how much of med in countries where it has been documented, there are so many deaths, to, uh, you know, 250,000 deaths each year is what, uh, you know, US reports. But where documentation is poor, we may have issues, okay? But studies have shown that interprofessional collaboration in healthcare can help to reduce preventable adverse drug reactions, decrease mortality rates, and optimize medication dosages. Third benefit I would say is it helps to start the treatment at the earliest. The sad part of healthcare is many of our clients consider healthcare as a waiting game right? Physicians wait for physicians, while physicians wait for other physicians, physicians wait for um, other health professionals, you know, for consultations, for the lab reports, sending back the lab results. Communication delays frustrate patients and waste our valuable time, and conditions can worsen, actually. So these gaps can be bridged by interprofessional collaboration or collaborative care that we are talking about. And Overall, uh, a, a, a care team collaboration platform can deliver the right information to the right people at the right time, right? Uh, so there are different methodologies for that, but it has been proved. And uh, perhaps uh, we can also look at the benefit in terms of how it can reduce inefficiencies and healthcare costs that I've already mentioned that. There are enough studies done uh, in places where it has followed. Uh, I would also add that uh, it improves staff relationships and uh, job satisfaction. One of the major things that we have seen specifically, uh, it happens not only for allied healthcare professionals, you know, uh, every health profession has its own subculture, knowledge base, philosophy. Now, when you add power structures, some will get prioritized over other. That is not good for the patient or for the hospital. We have to see at which point it's not you know, a care team. That sense of community, that sense of camaraderie can boost staff relationships.
always provide satisfaction to the job that you and me do. Uh, I, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, so comprehensively making us understand uh, about the, the fundamentals of interprofessional collaborative practice and the exponential benefits it's offering to the patient. For a patient, inter -collabor interprofessional collaborative practice appears to be a dream come true where all are working together for his or her welfare. And for professionals, interprofessional collaborative practice seems to be achieving that ultimate goal for which each of them are working. So thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us with the fundamentals of interprofessional collaborative practice. And with that, uh, I think we are ready to move to the next question uh, with uh, Dr. Anandar, sir. Sir, uh, we would like to know from you that uh, what are the prerequisites to make interprofessional collaborative practice effective? Uh, thank you, Dr. Gagan. Let me begin with uh, what I think I'll take a cue from what Sira said and the case scenario that you said. So your case scenario had a P, which is Prabhakaran. Siraj mentioned about where is the patient. I think I will begin with that as the cue as to where is the ingredient for that or the prerequisite for that effective interprofessional practice. Keep that patient at the center. The first prerequisite, and I'll be giving you five of those. The first prerequisite, my dear friends, keep that patient at the center. The patient is not at the periphery. The patient is not someone that, oh, okay, chaltaya, let us see. Let us do our work. We'll provide care and he will improve eventually. That should not happen. The first prerequisite we all need to keep in mind is, and if I may paraphrase what the father of the nation said, we exist because of that patient. So the first prerequisite, let us keep that patient at the center. Let us remember that his or her needs are the prime requirement as to why we are. Let us forget that I am there because of that. I am so, and I think Dr. Siraj touched upon this again when you're saying about that, this power equations, this hierarchy. I think we need to keep that away for a moment and keep that patient at the center. The second prerequisite, what was happening in Prabhakaran's case? If you ask me, many of them are not even aware as to what the other is doing. Believe me, honestly, if you ask me, what does the occupational therapist do? What does the physiotherapist do? What does the speech language pathologist do? I will only put that aura of knowledge as if I know everything that they do. In reality, my knowledge is zero. Ladies and gentlemen, I think, I think, I think again, uh, to bring out another important point, we actually do not know as to what the other profession does. Yes, it is fantastic. We work in a hospital. We work in large hospitals. We work in multi-speciality, tertiary care, quaternary care, and whatnot. We are so used to all this language that we don't know as to what the other profession does. I I'm a pulmonologist, so we do something similar. You give this example of stroke rehabilitation, Dr. Gagan, in the scenario, but we do what's called as pulmonary rehab. And pulmonary rehabilitation is something where we need to work closely with a lot of other professions. How many of my brethren actually speak to the physiotherapist, speak to the dietitian, try and understand as to what is sort of exercise regimen that needs to be given? Sadly, the answer would be no. Because, and it's not because we don't want to. And I'm not putting on my clinician side. It's not because I as a clinician don't want to. I just have no idea as to what the other profession brings in. What is the value add that comes in from these professions? And what is the role of each one of these professions in providing care? And that, I think, would be the second important prerequisite. The third, communicate, communicate, and communicate. Yes, I've deliberately said it thrice, and it is the third important factor. But communication is the foundation, if I may say, of all these things that we are saying. We are sadly working many a times in a scenario where hierarchies come into play. We forget different professions, even within our own professions. 
a junior resident or a senior, if I may use the medical college setup or in or a junior consultant, senior consultant, will think twice about thinking to a senior person. We are so sort of worried about what will he think? What will she think? We have made that as an important focus and have forgotten that the best way of addressing problems, the best way of gaining information just by speaking, just by communicating with each other. So that would be the third uh, important sort of prerequisite. All these, for all these to be successful, we need to understand that we need a good leadership. And here, I will just add another aspect. It's not just leadership. It should be a collaborative leadership. Now, leadership is not something which goes by a designation. The leadership should ideally go by who is the most suited for that role, who will be able to provide the maximum benefit for that particular aspect. And what better way than if all of us sit together or and together, whatever you would want to do. But we all sort of work together and work collaboratively in our strengths using some of these aspects to provide care to this uh, patient. The fifth important factor, and I deliberately kept it in the last, but that's actually one of my favorites, is teamwork. All of us said beautifully, together, everyone achieves more. Right? But do we actually do about it? I mean, it, you asked us to reflect at the end of the case, Dr. Kerr, but actually, if you ask to reflect ourselves, we work within teams within our own motives. What will I get out of the team? What is it there for me? What is in it for me? How am I going to benefit? But when yes. we work in these teams, the important thing is we need to keep that patient at the center. I'm going back to the very first prerequisite that I said earlier. We need to keep that patient at the center. And I think the key in, in any teamwork is I would just say the three aspects. We need to cooperate with one another. We need to collaborate with one another. And there has to be a coordination. The key aspect in the profession collaboration practice is let us understand there are hierarchies. There are professional hierarchies. There are certain equations. We need to set them aside. And why do we need to set them aside? For the simple reason that we need to improve the care that we give our patients. So it goes me again back to that first point patient at the center. So if I, to, if I have to say those five factors quickly, patient-centeredness, we need to have a role clarity, we need to have communication, collaborative leadership, and a very important ingredient, teamwork. I think, I think I mean, these five, these five things that we come together, I think we'll be able to give a very robust interprofessional collaborative practice. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing those five important ingredients which are going to be crucial in making interprofessional collaborative practice effective. So from your uh, several uh, years of experience as a, a practitioner, as a clinician in a hospital, uh, we would be very happy if you could share with us some pointers which should be embraced by the, uh, the professionals who are working in such a clinical practice. Uh, to make this interprofessional collaboration an everyday uh, practice. I mean, people don't leave it in the textbook. People don't leave it in these panel discussions. But we are able to go back and make it a part of our routine. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Gogan, for that excellent point. Because as you rightly said, many of these things are sound. So people get excited when they hear in a panel discussion, when they are hearing it for the first time. But what's more important is how we translate it into practice. And that's, that's where I think, let me, I, I told you the five prerequisites. Let me use the theme of five once I let me use the five mantras, if I may say. The, the first mantra, I will say, is clarity. Have those clear team goals. Why are we working together? Why are we collaborating in this particular thing? The idea is Mr. Prabhakaran should be able to go home ASAP as soon as possible. I'm going by the last thing which his wife said, with the least amount of money. I'm not saying give him free. There is healthcare comes at a cost. We need to understand. We need to give it in a way which is optimal. So the optimum care is provided in the best possible manner with the least amount of sort of uh, the uh, resource that the patient has to sort of uh, spend. I think so. That is the reason as to why we need to have this clarity. Because if we go back, the why of the patient is just not clear. Why is it that so many people come every day? Doctors come, nurses come. There is a speech language pathologist, physiotherapist, occupational therapist. There is a dietitian. The dietitian has been advised. I mean, I'll, I can go back to I mean, that's a wonderful case scenario. Chapati is advised and comes another professional expert comes and says the patient is not fit. 
So there is no clarity in what we are doing. So I think everybody is putting on their own sort of the blinkered vision and making it more and more narrow and confusing the wife of the patient. Imagine, that's the worst possible thing that we could do. Worst possible thing, because we are only making the fear of the relative sort of more uh, compounded and it's only going to make them lose faith in the system. That is the reason as to the first mantra is that clarity, the purpose as to why we have gotten together. And again, it goes back to the same one, the patient-centeredness. So we need to work towards that one common goal. I think that's the first thing. The next aspect, and this is something that I've realized uh, having spent so many uh, years now in clinical practice, is that a sense of belonging, that shared team identity. As to, I mean, uh, we sort of still, I mean, let, let's be very honest. We say that we work in teams, but we still work within teams within, okay, what is my profession's role in this? What am I going to be doing? We never really sort of sit together or collaborate together. That, that cup of coffee that we could have sitting together and discussing this uh, these patients. I think it, it hardly happens. So I think the best thing is to have, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying a formal meeting, but to informally have these discussions, to get it rolling and to have that sense of belonging, stating that, okay, I am a valued member of this team. It's not that I, it's not that I have been called because someone said involve him or someone said involve her. No, that identity, that feeling should come from within saying that I belong to this team. I think that would be the second uh, mantra. The third mantra again is, is, is another thing that shared team commitment. I think from I to V, it's a big journey. It's, it's just a letter, but I to V, as we all know, is a big journey. We need to start speaking that word that we will improve this patient. We will ensure that the patient walks out. We, we and we should replace I, I and I. And that can happen. It's not that I mean, it's not a, it's not a theoretical concept. Because many people thought, oh, this is he's saying so much of Jan. But yes, like it takes time. And that's the first thing I'm going to say. Be patient. Don't be in a hurry. Things are not going to change overnight. I to V is a journey. It's a journey which is going to have obstacles. It's a journey where there's going to be a lot of thorns on the way. But believe me, over with perseverance and patience, it's a matter of time before we actually ensure that uh, we reach there. The fourth important aspect, the fourth mantra, is we need to respect each other. I think I think I cannot I cannot go and say that this team is going to be successful if I'm going to be imposing my viewpoint. I am the clinician. I know the best. You help me. Who asked you to? Help? This is what the other people is going to say. Mayor. They or may not, they may say it a lot, but that's the emotion that's going to come on their mind. So I think we need to understand and respect the autonomy of each profession and importantly value what they bring. I think I think that's that's the fourth mantra that I would say. The last mantra, and I think the fifth mantra is very, very important of support and the context in which we work to. And as, as Dr. Sira again rightly said, I think we are fortunate to be working in a setup where we have got all these specialities together under one roof be it in education or be it in collaboration, and where we've got a management which is very supportive of this. So, so the supportive context, be in terms of material, I mean, from the quality background, we say there are seven names, men, material, money, measurement, blah, 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 blah. All these resources are very, very important. Because the reason as, because I'm sure, what is the reason, if you go back as to why, if I go back to why is it that people don't actually start implementing it? When they try and implement, they don't get that necessary support. Someone will say, hey, that's all blah, 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 blah. Why are you doing it? Nonsense. I think all that enthusiasm that was there in that person has now sort of disappeared forever. But we have nipped it in the very beginning itself. That is the reason as to why that support to context becomes uh, very, very important. But again, I think that uh, zeal to ensure that the patient improves because of V is the success factor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaya. Thank you, sir. And as you uh, really took us, that, that journey from I to V is going to be the most uh, pivotal concept which we have to move to to bring the change. Thank you so much, sir. And I'm sure this is really going to help uh, our professions who are on board. And I'm very sure that our patients who are on board, people with communication disorders who are on board must be feeling that, yes, this is something we have always wished. This is something I've always wanted, that people work together, healthcare workers work together to address my concerns. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, to all our uh, audience, uh, you are uh, 
absolutely please free to drop in any questions clarifications which you have uh, as our discussion is going forward and uh, we'll be very happy to have those questions presented to our panelists towards the end of our discussion so thank you uh, let's take this discussion forward and uh, the the next important uh, uh, area which we i want to touch upon during this discussion is uh, uh, for you, Dr. Animesh, uh, sir, uh, we know that uh, you are from a background of community medicine, plus uh, a core member of an interprofessional institute which is proposing, which is advocating these concepts. Now, uh, audiologists and speech language pathologists uh, work actively in community-based uh, setup where early identification and intervention is a very crucial part of our services. And we work together with Anganwadi workers, social workers in such community scenarios to identify and manage communication disorders for people who cannot reach, who are in remote locations, who need our services but are not aware. So for such a community-based setup and scenario, so what are the principles of interprofessional collaborative practice and how can they be applied uh, to yield effective outcomes? Dr. Animesh. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Uh, this is a very, very important point that you have brought up and uh, continuing with what my previous speakers, Dr. Siraj and Dr. Anand have said, and especially Dr. Anand has talked about in the clinical setup in the hospital, now, as we know, like if we take the example of uh, Mr. Prabhakar himself, once he is discharged, he has to go back and go back home. Now, depending on whether Mr. Prabhakar is working or whatever he is, he will need some support. Let's look at another scenario when we have, you talked about, you know, early uh, say identification. You know, when we say that we want to like identify early or diagnose early and maybe we want to do screening. Now, once you do that, so again, if you're looking at maybe disabilities or maybe say hearing Im impairment or maybe speech language pathology related uh, issues in children. Now, again, we need to have this kind of approach. And as you said, Anganwadi workers, of course, but let me also tell you that we need to think of other people as well. I would say that, you know, we should get on board people like psychologists, counselors, as well as school teachers. Because it's very, very important that first, they are sensitized. They are also aware of these things and they should know how to handle it. Because once, if at all, we put a child on therapy or we, we start some treatment, it's an ongoing process. It's not that, you know, it's a one time or two time or maybe a month and that's it. So sometimes some of them will require months together to sometimes years. And when they are, say, sometimes rehabilitating in any kind of these disorders, speech related disorders, they might require much longer support. So at that time, we need to have, I would suggest that we need to have a system where we plan together. So we get them on board, we get them sensitized, and then the whole thing like works as a system. It's not that, of course, we cannot expect that ASLP professionals will be always there in the community. But what happens is there's a communication channel which is there between them. And they all have their roles cut out. So it's it's the role clarity again, which has to be there. So what has to be done by people at home, how they support, what will be done at maybe, and I would suggest that even, or what I can even imagine is some of the areas, like when we have worked in interior communities and all, I've gone to like uh, rural areas and even interior areas in the you know peripheries of Mangalore and even sometimes elsewhere. So I have seen that there are sometimes self-help groups which are very, very strong. And these self-help groups are there in many of the communities which are working in many areas. I can even think of sometimes youth, which are like, we have sometimes seen that Nehru Yuva Mandal and other places, uh, some other kind of groups, which are very, very uh, keenly involved in some development activities. I'm sure that we can get them on board. So they can come on board and they can start helping us. They can provide a place because many of these self-help groups or Nehru Yuva Mandals have a place where you can have some kind of a setup where we can have these screening camps. Also, there could be some kind of 
like when you want to deliver some sessions so you can have a place again and where or if you need to do some kind of exercises and other things there is a place there they also can play a part other than that i think we have a good system which is developing now we have had but now it's more you know so developing which is a primary healthcare system now we have a setup of primary healthcare centers which are present in far flung areas rural areas i think we need to think of the the people there and i would say that we have to get on board the doctor there because many times especially if i'm not talking about the urban setup i'm talking about the rural setup the interior setup now when we are talking of that first the people if at all they will visit those places now if the doctor there is also part of this and they they are aware and they are part of the team and there is a aslp person also involved and they all follow the kind of you know the communication as well as the, the treatment principles and they know about it and there is a mechanism of referral and back referral and there is again a mechanism where you can have a documentation and with the involvement of these asha workers anganwadi workers i know that they are burdened but they are very committed let me tell you that and they are the ones who are liaising with the com- community all the time so they can be on boarded and they can play a part so they will definitely and i have seen some of them deal very patiently with children who have not about speech language pathology but i have seen sometimes some of the children who have difficulty learning disabilities and others they are very patient in fact sometimes i i really admire we go to the anganwadis and we have seen that they are really good at that so if we can get them on board and they are also good at convincing people so they can have a very good role to even sometimes the family members or the relatives and also to to probably change the mindset of the people because one thing you have to remember is there's also a lot of stigma and social things which are there now if somebody has even a, a dyslexia or maybe even a slurring of speech now that itself becomes he is like he or she becomes a, a, a an object of ridicule so that also has to be looked at so i'm looking at it from a different angle and i'm trying to look at it from you know we have to come up with a system where we have a multi pronged kind of strategy where we approach this problem and we have everybody involved i talked about school now look at it from that point of view where teachers who are sensitized they know instead of them actually trying to uh, think of these students as maybe slow learners or maybe impediment or maybe they are not fit for instead they try to bring in a system where they encourage even the other students to partner with them and there is also a a person who is qualified enough and even counselors are there so all these will play a part and we need to look at it from that kind of a society where we are looking up of course it will not happen overnight it will not happen over a period of weeks it will take probably years but we have to start thinking in that terms and i hope that you know some of your uh, participants who are listening today they start thinking in that way and we can come up with a system where we can at least maybe start like i know dr harihar is there in panel he started with the dream of you know making it as able anand so disability friendly anand so similarly we have to start somewhere we have to start with a, maybe a place and model and that can become a model which can be replicated so that's something which i can envisage and and i think that way and please remember my uh, you know previous speakers have said this is not just you know we have different people coming together it has to be also the planning together they know what is cut out for them what is their role and how do they fit in and everybody is complementary it's not i'm competing i'm complementary and everybody is viewed with respect and dignity and everybody has a part in that team so that's how i look at it i hope i have been able to give you some perspective on this i'd be happy to clarify further uh dr gagan you've not unmuted you've not unmuted yourself please unmute yourself yes uh, thank you uh, animesh sir uh, that was very uh, clear and i am sure that uh, many of our friends who are there on board today would agree that when we are in such community based setups and as you have clearly said how important it is to uh, broaden and widen those professional uh, boundaries and bring more people who who are actually working at the grassroots who know about the problem and who are going to play a crucial role for us to effectively address the issues in community thank you so much sir and yes that has raised really-
really given a lot of uh, you know insight to all our friends who work in community based setup thank you sir and uh, next we next our eminent panelists whom we have on uh, board is dr hari hara who is a physiotherapist by profession um, i hope i am audible to you dr hari hara yeah yeah sure yes yes I yes, yes. Uh, dr hari hara my next question which is for you is uh, you know that there are Uh, such clinical population like individual children with cerebral palsy children with global developmental delay individuals who are receiving stroke rehabilitation now these are some areas where i'm sure you would appreciate you would have appreciated that uh, physiotherapists and speech language pathologists or audiologists work in a very close uh, proximity and collaboration to address the issues so uh, how do you think interprofessional practice a professional collaborative practice can be made effective in these scenarios from your experience yeah thank you dr gagan for uh, bringing out this important issue um I, yes i i believe this these rehabilitational professionals like uh, you and me occupational therapists uh, vocational trainers so these people play a major role in bringing these people once they uh, get out of the acute care as it is rightly said you know the surgeon or the physician they uh, uh, bring in uh, you know years to their life they make them survive once when they get down into stroke or whatever the severe major conditions you know they save them but to add quality of life to the years remaining years once when they survive it is basically brought on by these rehabilitational uh, professionals so uh, in fact there there comes and we these people whether it is uh, child with cerebral palsy or uh, global developmental delay or even parkinsons these patients they have an array of uh, symptoms they are they have lot of complexities inherent to this uh, to the disease uh, and I, i just to quote you know i recollected when this uh, when this plan panel was uh, you know uh, introduced i remember some few years before uh, there was a child uh, she came to our department for early intervention uh, the child suffered uh, you know prenatal uh, problems because of which she landed up into uh, spastic uh, diplegia where she could not able to move the lower limbs it was um, high tone hypertonicity and um, uh, uh, the child could could able to look at us and so we were trying to give uh, regular physiotherapy limb physiotherapy to reduce the tone and we have been trying to communicate talking to the child uh, to lift the leg to move the leg to uh, position yourself so when we were trying to do all these instructions to bring out the uh, you know movement in that child we were surprised the child uh, was not behaving in a right way there was some haphazard movement though we felt as movement uh, specialist as physios we felt that there is something which is missing out though the child could able to perform that movement when we give simple commands like you know raise your thumb or hold this pen or look at us and you know to our surprise when we try to interact more deeper into it we came to know that the child has got a hearing uh, problem she could not able to hear which probably the parents didn't uh, they are not aware or the referring pediatrician uh, couldn't able to give any probably he may be knowing that but there was no notes or any uh, documentation in their case file because of which we were trying to work on that and it was not happening then we have to intervene and bring in the audiologist into the picture talk to the ent surgeon and some amount of hearing some some uh, you know uh, artificial a cochlear implant was done and to our uh, surprise amazingly in the next two years were uh, you know miracle for her she could able to uh, come on toes with some uh, orthotic devices and other uh, some supportive exercises you know there we realized that it is absolutely a team approach like how dr siraj dr animation dr anand talked about it is moving from i to v we have to uh, share that belongingness we have to take the ownership to me as a physio when we uh, talk about such conditions uh, cerebral palsy or stroke rehab most of the uh, complexities come when they get discharged from the acute care setting when they visit the hospital as an outpatient or at the uh, community level i believe uh, that you know coming together as we call you know uh, that is the beginning and staying together if you want to progress stay together all the professionals and uh, you know you have to work together to be successful to simply state you know any one discipline representative uh, will not uh, possess the knowledge to meet the collective needs of a person with severe disabilities you know it is ultimately as it was told by dr siraj we have to learn from with about each other 
so that can happen only when we uh, have this education before you preach you have to practice and uh, you know before you practice you have to educate so after getting on to this famer fellowship program and all we got to know in depth about all these principles competencies you know uh, based on that when we try to approach in the outpatient department my understanding is uh, this integrated approach we need to start right from the beginning uh, you know that is i call it as unified assessment unified assessment means you know group of professionals when i as a physio when i assess for uh, motor uh, problems or sensory issues or uh, balance coordination multiple issues i need the uh, speech language pathologist next to me for that matter the neurologist along with me so when we uh, plan to have this unified assessment we set some common goals you know what is that i am going to do what is that you are going to do and you know, what does that neurologist expect out of a physio and uh, uh, when a physio may refer back the patient back to the neurologist for consultation so when we come for a unified assessment uh, module we could able to sit together put a plan short term goals long term goals and work on that direction but what having said this you know uh, there are a lot of barriers in uh, ipcp also interprofessional collaborative practice though we understand it is the need of the hour and it is going to make a sea change in the healthcare uh, sector but there are a lot of barriers one barrier which i feel being in a multi speciality hospital and that in an academic institute one is time when do i have all these people on board how do i bring them on board second uh, problem is that um, you know there, there are hierarchies you know should the physiotherapist go to a neurologist side or when a neuro neurologist should come to the physiotherapy opd there are you know having said all these uh, possibilities that there are hiccups there are bottlenecks which is there in the journey it's not a soft journey as we all uh, know so what uh, the solution for that what it's it's a practical solution what i did in our in our institutes one is that we uh, made it uh, make it uh, we made it a point whenever we work with a child or with such patient uh, you know the documentation is very very important communication probably you may not be able to call him to communicate uh, personally or sometime even telephonically also when you are there how busy he is he may be operating or he may be not some other ward rounds or whatever so what we did was we clearly recorded all the things either in the form of not alone notes it can be a illustration you make diagrams or to that extent sometimes we do a video capture so when when all these in, in any of these forms where it can be much more descriptive and you know the, the technology can use whatsapp or through telegram or uh, you know you can share all those pictures videos to that particular group you identify the group you know who are the group of professionals who are going to come together to uh, bring change in their life like physios neurologists aslps or um, vocational trainers so let them be on board you can create a whatsapp group share all these illustrations videos and put your comments that this is what is happening and this is what i am trying to do and we need your intervention at this junction what is it and i found this method to be a much more better way than bringing them together because scheduling block scheduling is not that easy in a busy setup so uh, that is one thing which we did it and the second uh, thing what i did in my institution alone is that uh, we started having this monthly interprofessional camps camp doesn't need, we need not have to go to uh, you know community setup if possible we do that as well in the existing hospital setup itself we declare one day let's say 15th of every month uh, it's if it's not a sunday you know all these uh, you know we have identified even if not the busy head of the department we can have the resident from the particular uh, department i want a radiologist to be there the radiology resident can be there so seven eight people based on the condition we do that a stroke camp or it can be cerebral palsy camp like we, these people come on that day all these patients will be screened thoroughly so we made it as a time table in our academic calendar clinical calendar that monthly interdisciplinary or this interprofessional camp we named it as an ip camps so mandatorily all these uh, patients and as it was very correctly told by dr siraj and dr anand the patient centric patient of course the family members empowering the family members brings the right change you know involve them into this shared decision making when we want to refer the child for tenotomy or for some tendon release you know we need to collectively have the patient along with the parents or the spouse whoever it is talk to them and shared in for decision making is very very essential and it is not that we have to buy the technique they have they we have to sell the technique they have to buy the technique because they understand my patient my my husband my child needs this so when we explain to them when we educate them we are not selling our product they buy it yes i need uh, this brace to be given to for the lower limb of the child so that he or she can stand so when this camp when we come to that one day is like a mela uh, believe me I, i you know you have to visit sometimes to see that that day 
parents people come around all the professionals and i and i have to you know put in records that no hods come no even associate professor only the residents mostly are the tutors from all the departments but that to make a big change i know when we collectively work together that brings the quality of life and each uh, each one of us understand everybody's problem what do you what is your approach what is my approach and where we commonly meet as in your slide you have put it together all the pencils coming together there is one convergent point where we all uh, come together so ultimately it is the patient functional independence or it can be you know a simple goal of making him sit on the chair without support that itself can be a big goal where we have to work for uh, ortho orthosis needs to come into role physiotherapist and then of course occupational therapist you know many things come over there so when we fix that goal when we come together that converging it makes real difference so that though the bottleneck where is still still there but these two approaches and another third one uh, simple thing which i found is more effective when we approach to such complexities patients have instead of writing diagnosis and uh, symptoms what we started doing is that you know we have this uh, icfdh classification that is international classification of functioning disability and health where uh, we talk about social participation activity restrictions what is there uh, present in them what is not positive or negative when we try to put all those things in order rather than symptoms you know the the difficulties when we put it in that icfdh classification it becomes much more easier and it, it helps the other team members to engage, engage themselves into what exactly this professional is addressing to and he could able to relate himself and then give his own idea and there comes the collaborative uh, practice coming really into existence and that brings in more light and uh, you know uh, positive output for the patient so these three four things which i feel uh, is much more effective and again when we go third last one is that uh, prognostic assessment because these patient as dr animesh said you know it may be for some patients for few months or few years or for some patients it may be lifelong we have to give support so when we know that we need to set a you know proper uh, deadline you know how frequently we need to do the reassessment you know otherwise most of the time what happens is that we just continue with the similar kind of therapeutic intervention because other problems which are there in the patients we are not knowing so when we are coming together as uh, a collaborative practitioners when we uh, when we work for it we set a you know common uh, point when the reassessment should be done and it should be again integrated the uh, assessment and you can have these outcome measurement tools where we can commonly uh, incorporate it and change the plan when we are changing the plan it should be communicated back to the other professionals also i have been doing this practice till now and the patient condition has moved from uh, say a to b or b to c so now my intervention is going to be this so when that is clearly communicated to them and uh, that can also bring in lot of uh, changes so these are my personal experiences apart from that um, what i feel that can be best uh, if it can be effectively incorporating uh, ipp hope that answers the thank question thank you thank you thank you dr hari hara uh, you, you took us from the point where you told us how as a physiotherapist professional you have realized the need that wish other professionals like speech language pathologists could come with you address the patient needs you took us to a point in where the importance of technology in bringing professionals together and uh, then ultimately coming to a point where you told us how it's like a, how interprofessional collaboration has become a, a mela where patients are so happy to come and attend only because multiple professionals will understand their issues together and at one place at one point their issues will be getting addressed together so thank you so much dr hari hara coming it from your mouth also means a lot to us so thank you so much thank you uh, so thank you doctor yes taking this discussion forward uh now we would like uh, sirat sir and dr krishna to please uh, help us understand that having understood what interprofessional collaborative practice is having understood its benefits its need and the way we should be working uh, what is the way forward that we can achieve this collaborative practice ready health workforce in our future so uh, dr siraj and dr krishna we would like to know this from you so uh, we'll have dr siraj first and then we'll have uh, dr krishna hello everyone yes sir 
So uh, as we uh, try to wrap up uh, today's discussion, um, uh, you have titled it the way forward, right? The way forward yes, is always better to, you know, you need to look backward many a times to go forward. So uh, I would uh, basically put up three important recommendations that came from Macy's Foundation. Macy's Foundation works in interprofessional uh, care, interprofessional practice, uh, which of course I think is important in the context of, uh, you know, communication disorders. Also. Uh, having said that, I will focus on the most generic aspects. Uh, Dr. Krishna will take it further uh, specific to the profession. Now, yes, uh, yes. as it came from the foundation, it says, it is time to make changes in the content and conduct. I repeat, content and conduct <coughs> of health professions education necessary to graduate practitioners who will partner with patients, families, and communities. So the first aspect is change in the content and conduct. Content change ha will come only from, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the official bodies that have been entrusted with the delivery of the course, the regulatory bodies, accreditation agencies to some extent, even the conduct. When you look at conduct, specifically related to partnerships, uh, unfortunately, if we are asked to find out from our curriculum, which are those tenets that are basically addressed, you know, in terms of teamwork, collaboration, communication in teams, uh, we may not see many. The second recommendation is make changes in health professions education, organization and healthcare organizations necessary to facilitate durable partnerships, both new and existing that is with the patients, families, and communities. So while the first one largely looked at the content and conduct, the second recommendation is changes in the organizations and healthcare organizations necessary to facilitate partnership. Third, I feel is the most important. Build the capacity for partnership, you know, and that is where you and me have a role. Now, it doesn't end there among patients families, communities, and as a health professions educators, right, and healthcare organizations. So these three are very important, these recommendations. Now, for anybody who is interested in setting up collaborations in, in, in this particular aspect, uh, it can be related to interprofessional education, it can be related to practice. It's always better to seek out evidence uh, as it is the norm, you know, you look for existing publications, you look for centers that have trained people. So uh, that is how, in fact, uh, the, the Manipal story of interprofessional education practice begins, where we tried to reach out to people who actually were doing this uh, for educators, because I know that most of you on this forum are educators. There are many excellent resources for getting started with this. Begin with the WHO framework, which includes suggestions for actions, participants, and outcomes. Just Google it, WHO framework for interprofessional education and practice. You will get that. So those who are interested in pursuing this should consider reading this document. It will be a primer for you to work with. And in clinical practice, uh, you can see that it, it's, it's hard to see that people have started developing policies, competencies, you know, look at the new uh, one that National Medical Commission puts out, you know, uh, though it does not really say interprofessional education or, you know, uh, uh, practice, there are ample evidences or areas where you can see that competencies are related to teamwork, communication, team building, now, that should be a part of most of our curricula, physical therapy, speech therapy, nursing, medicine, dentistry. Now, there are different ways of doing it. One of the simplest ways is to have such modules where we can have these students from diverse professions coming together. For example, let's say patient safety. So 
these uh, are the promising areas that you know one could start with uh, and uh, also as i told you collaborate with the experts our collaboration started off with the world leader in interprofessional uh, education and practice that is canada uh, in fact uh, uh, they have a system and in a national interprofessional competency framework which has been integrated to all this health professional education and we were fortunate enough to have professor john gilbert to mentor us uh, because uh, it's very important to learn uh, from the right uh, uh, trainers you know uh, so uh, lastly before i leave this to dr krishna <clears throat> i feel for any of these initiatives to be successful faculty development is extremely critical so institutions professional bodies like what we having right now it has been actually uh, you know um, being uh, organized by a professional body they must be willing to invest the resources necessary to develop faculty into communities of collaborators who can model these traits and behaviors to the students so we know there are number of faculty we have we just don't have to blame the clinicians alone or you know some subsets alone they are legendary for their inability to work well with others they cannot work well with others are not at all good ambassadors for interprofessional care so these are the same people who are going to be very critical when you talk about these things they will not appreciate training in the topic so bridging the gap for these faculty members is going to be difficult but there are successful method where we can have team oriented training specifically if you have all these people working in the same area faculty development should be developed using the same educational pr principles that we use which we use for the students not that they are going to be different because they are faculty you will use active learning you will use problem solving you will use team based learning and a number of things so what i am trying to tell you is faculty development is critical specifically when you are going to take this into education and of course obviously it has to be because then only it gets converted into practice now as often said when discussing collaboration the key issues include putting the community first or the client first the organization second and oneself last and prejudices aside so it's very important through collaboration we hopefully can work together for a better future thank you thank you dr siraj and uh, all the panelists dr anand and uh, dr harihara who have really have got us into a lot of information related to interprofessional uh, practice the meaning of it uh, of what it is and dr animesh has also explained to us how we can work in the community now here with the multiple roles which i am uh, you know as i have been introduced uh, as a president of isha as a key member there and also speech and hearing fraternity i am really uh, at the outset before giving my uh, thoughts here i would uh, i you know from deep of my heart i would thank my mentors you know who all dr siraj and who are all there on this panel who have really opened eyes on this concept of interprofessional education and practice it's as you all our training setups you know as said by the rehabilitation council of india we do recommend to have each institution to have a multiple specialties and we are exposed to this a kind of a cases which are there now as you all heard there are very key components to make it as as interprofessional practice we all have been doing only interdisciplinary practice multi speciality practice in the first outset it has been said like how critical the healthcare system and how you need to keep the patient center and this is what we need to uh, one more most of the examples you heard so far uh, is from the speech side i'll take one more example from the audiology side you know it's like uh a simple case with the hearing loss comes 
and uh, he visits a ENT surgeon and the ENT says, okay, there's some problem. Let's do evaluation for a hearing evaluation and he refers to an audiologist. And when it comes to an audiologist, he looks the case sheet, he takes the history and which we are all doing most of the time. We see the case history. Okay, and see what are the recommendations have been done by the ENT physician or a surgeon. Okay, Puton audiometry, and then you start doing it and then send it. No, that's not the right professional and interprofessional practices. If you want to look from the benefit of the patient, understand the patient, then your approach is going to be different. And as the purpose of this event, what we are looking at it is increasing that awareness of that interprofessional practice, what it means. I'm sure you all would have got an idea of what it does it mean. It's completely different what we are doing currently and it needs a lot more involvement from us. Now, for the point what we are trying to discuss on this slide, you know, the road is very long. As our panelists also have said, we have a long way to go. It's just a beginning from both the association side and also from the institutions, which we are involved in various education activities, where we are just beginning. We are a healthcare professionals who are and need to work in this inter-collaboration. Unless we start working there and we'll not be able to achieve the good outcomes and we will not be able to improve the quality of life. We always feel the hurdles, even the panelists also have said the hurdles which they have said, but you also have heard how it can be overcome by Dr. Harira with his practical example, what he said. You don't have to be having a very big team. I would request even my mentors to correct me if I'm wrong. Inter-collaboration practice can start with a small team. You know, you don't have to have, okay, five, six people are there in this kind of a thing. So let's all get together. It can just start with two professionals also. If you are working with a child or with a patient where one more professional is there, as the principal says, first is you need to be keeping him center. What is the best required for the patient then? understand his problems, communicate with the people, communicate with the other professionals. It can be in an official setup or an informal setup. To start with, informal setups can go much better, interact with them. Then start working on role clarities also, trying to work, okay, I'm trying to going to do, this is my achievement, this is what I'm, my goals are there. Do you think that this is fine? And you start working on them also. And they can give an input. That input don't feel that, oh, who are you to tell to me? But try to understand keeping the patient front and see if these thoughts are relevant and you can modify your plan of management. And then you start collaboratively working, frequently monitoring and things. The beginning has to start. And the beginning, let's do it a day, if not tomorrow. Today, do it uh, slowly, step by step, and we can definitely achieve that. And uh, as Dr. Siraj has pointed out also, whenever we venture out to the new activities, you need to seek help. You need to understand what we are talking about it. Unless we learn, we will not be able to implement. And this is part of your continuing education also. So as future head, when you look at it, the education is important, capacity building is important, then starting practice from step by step. So just let's open up for the idea and let them start with this concept of collaborative practice, which can make a lot of difference in the quality of life of, of people whom we serve. Should I? Yeah. Krishna, Taking sir, to the next to one, uh, what uh, Gagan was telling in terms of how, especially in speech and hearing uh, professionals, uh, with more specific to us also. Uh, as I was saying, there's a need uh, for uh, making a change. And a change needs to start 
from both uh, regulatory bodies, from the institutions, and we as an individuals. Uh, regulatory bodies can be an issue because it's a very long process. But uh, with the input, what I've been getting it from our mentors, also what I see is with the existing one also, we can start building uh, these concepts in our system currently. I do know some of the training centers across India, a uh, couple of centers have started working on it and started having conducting a frequent uh, you know, workshops and seminars in understanding and this capacity building. But it needs to go to the next stage of it in terms of start implementing it, start making it reality. And this is possible, this is possible. And especially the youngsters who are getting trained in, uh, in the graduate program or a postgraduate programs, start from your internship access, even in your own, uh, you know, from right from the second year, third year onwards, when you start having your clinical practices, don't just look at a case as just, you know, oh, case has come, let me do my job and then send it. Try to understand what the case problem is there. If required, go and interact with the medical professionals and understand what's the medical issue is there with the problem. And then start working, what is the second, contribute for the information, what further evaluations, if I can do, can contribute the physician in formulating the uh, diagnosis. And once you formulate that, you know, the medical condition, then you can start working on the rehabilitation or the management of it. This constant communication can start right from your education and the faculty who also need to understand that to encourage that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of people's involvement which is there and there's a lot of scope for us to work and implement in this aspect of it. And Isha from side also, we are going to make a step towards this in terms of creating a special interest group uh, wherein to foster this kind of, uh, you know, the faculty who are there in terms of developing uh, this collaborative and interprofessional collaborative practice. As the word sounds, you know, the, what you have heard here, there will be a lot of doubts. There have been questions already raised also in the panel, uh, in the question and answer session. So we, we need to iron out them to make it as clear so that we can implement it. So there's a future and we can work together in uh, our uh, field also and make it happen. I think even within our own profession, the relationship between audiologist and speech language pathologist needs to improve. That also is an intercollaboration. So there's a long way to go. Okay, Kagan. Yes, thank you. So thank you for the question. And from there, when you talk about it, you, you know the impact it's going to have on our profession is going to be an exponential impact. And I'm sure that uh, the foundation which has been laid with this panel discussion on interprofessional collaborative practice, we understand the importance of inter education and the cult, the need for building that culture right early in and uh, so when we are talking about interprofessional uh, collaborative practice if we remember uh, mr prabhakaran's example this is what we have been talking about having mr prabhakar at the center where everybody is meeting discussing talking about mr prabhakaran and that's something what the takeaway message of uh, today's panel discussion is. So uh, we are going into quick question answer round. We see that in the question answer uh, uh, panel uh, there, the questions have been asked uh, with respect to role clarity and importance of communication, which have been already answered uh, by our panelist, Dr. Anand Sir. Uh, Dr. Hari Hara has answered those questions. Uh, we'll take a couple of more questions which are there on that uh, panel box and uh, we'll request our panelists to answer those questions for us. One of the first questions which we would take is 
that apart from basic skills in delegation, how do you set boundaries with co-professionals so that stepping on toes of another professional can be prevented? Now, these are, there are team members with whom communication doesn't work necessarily. So do we always go via the leader? How do we engage in group counseling sessions in such scenarios? Uh, so, Ragan, if uh, I may uh, add, take that query. Anand, sir, please. Yeah, please, I think uh, please, it, it's, it's a very valid point. But that's that's the practical scenario. Let's let, let's understand because as I, as you said, as I also alluded to and uh, rightly pointed out in your question, it's important that we translate all that we have learned into practice. And these are the actual practical issues that we are uh, we actually face in in the workplaces. So I think. Uh, Again, I'll go back, communicate, communicate, and communicate. And that's where, again, to a related query that was asked, it's very important that we have role clarity so that we don't step on someone else's toes. Uh, it, it, it's always a good thing to agree to disagree. But uh, there's another point, I think someone said, how much should we be assertive? I think there was a context, there's another thing, I'm um, a junior thing as to how do you address these hierarchical issues. The next thing we need to have is we need to have patience because, yes, uh, it, it may not work very easily. Communication is a sort of a two sort of two way approach, is what I would say. Many times, what happens is I keep communicating, the other person just does not. It's like something falling on someone's deaf ears, or they don't want to respond. And so uh, we just have to keep communicating, and importantly, show them evidence of how it works. Because at the end of the day, if we are able to sort of improve the care that I that the patient gets, and the patient walks out happy. He or she is our biggest ambassador. And that word spreads. The moment that word spreads, you will suddenly realize this person who was in a hard nut to crack will suddenly come and make that sort of yes. small conversation, come and ask you, okay, can we, and sort of hint towards working together. So yes, it's, it's, it's a very valid point. Uh, you need to sort of identify the right sets of people. The, your, the first sort of a projects that you take, as Dr. Krishna also pointed out, you can start small. Start developing some evidences, some success stories, which you can actually use to get the naysayers on board. Because they'll, they'll always be there. And yes, you can you can always use the leader. But uh, every every strategy, I would say, has to be used in moderation. Don't use one single strategy because that's not going to work every time. So use a mix and match of various strategies that that's going to work. If group counseling is going to work, use that strategy. If you think if you're in an organization and the leader's word is going to make a difference, use that strategy. So I think uh, in, in a nutshell, different approaches uh, in different ways so that end result is uh, what we all wish for. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for answering that question so nicely. And uh, we have another question uh, which, which is about that collaborative practice may become co-method of service delivery in hospital setups, but there can be challenges in implementing such a model everywhere. How does a young professional be assertive to his work? He, she has to work in a reputed place. Um, that's the question. Uh, Sirat, sir? Yeah, Gagan, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're okay. brought in this. Yeah, uh, I think Anand partly addressed this, but I, I, I will mention that uh, assertiveness, I, I think, was asked in the context of in, uh, being a junior and in an established setting. Uh, how do we become assertive? Now, one problem is that, <laughs> that it's a fine line being assertive and being overconfident. So that is something that, uh, you know, uh, we have to understand. And uh, it's a learning curve. Uh, it doesn't come to everyone. We have seen people who have been in this profession for a long time, you know, in our own professions, but still have not mastered it, the assertiveness aspect. Okay. So the, the developing assertiveness can be a learning curve for many of them. But let me tell you, there are certain things that we have to bear in mind because uh, you're talking about patients' well-being. The context is patient-centeredness, a very emotional, emotive subject. Conflicts are there over the best interest, and it's going to be, you know, it can flare up specifically if you have, uh, uh, you know, seniors in the team. And what, uh, I don't know who has put this question, but it's, it's very valid question. It can happen. Now, 
uh, this itself can go into a big workshop and how do I become assertive as a junior, especially in a clinical setting or, you know, but uh, let me tell you that uh, one of those things is to keep in mind as I learned it and, you know, we had experience from our own mentors is do not rush into a situation, you know, uh, that can be a problematic stuff because you out of your enthusiasm, uh, if you're going to rush into the situation, there are possibilities that you may have to regret because even if you're right. So best is uh, if you can talk the issue through with someone who is probably not directly linked to the situation. It could be a peer, it could be a supervisor, it could be a mentor. I mean, that is perhaps the first step, you know. Now, stick to factual statements. If you have a factual, factual issue at hand, stick to those saying that look last month we had 25 cases of post-operative infections you know and i feel that so you have evidence backing you even if you are a junior doesn't matter you, you know you are using facts but if the issue is more personal then you have to speak clearly about how you felt about the scenario and if a senior uh, is going to behave in a way that has made you feel uncomfortable, uh, you know, and made you concerned. What to speak that? <clears throat> and there are many seniors in this forum who are listening to this. So encouraging others to speak how they feel, especially in this setting, are very, very important. You know, make sure that you have you know, demonstrated what you have done or said, as I'm talking about, I mean, when it comes to seniors. But mm -hmm. otherwise, if you look at you know, there are a number of ways how you become assertive at work at your workstations. There are plenty of literature available on that. That holds good here also. But remember that you are talking not about a, a you know a, a company executive or a production manager or a football coach or you know you are talking about uh, people who are involved with patient care. You know, and that is where the difference is. So that analogy of a team of a hockey team or a football team and say that, look, this is how a team is formed. This is how you got to be assertive may not work. I, I beg to differ that may not work as many trainers would say with uh, a healthcare team. So be certain about what you want to speak about. You know, your communication style defines your assertive skills and consider important things. Don't, you know, uh, talk about things which are relatively trivial in that particular aspect, you know, so that means you got to prepare yourself and reduce it and filter it and, you know, and uh, always don't forget to control the volume because people are likely to label you as arrogant. Look at this junior guy. He just came to the department. He just came to the unit. Look at the way you would probably have just tried to be assertive. So don't control your volume. You know, then avoiding degrading language. You say, you can't say, you know, the way you did was rubbish. So avoid those things. Don't be, you know, evaluative or judgmental about things. Be descriptive. You know, that's a very important thing in communication. And above all, trust yourself. Understand the circumstance and context where you work. And then, of course, you yourself can estimate your level of assertiveness. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, that has very clearly answered the importance of interprofessional and interpersonal uh, skills like communication which are required uh, to such situations. And we already uh, know the, the outcome of this panel discussion when we read in our chat box a senior person like Gayatri Ma'am saying, that we as audiologists and speech language pathologists open up, go attend interprofessional conferences, seminar, speak, make presence felt, tell them, uh, tell the world, you know, the importance of you as a team, important team member. And uh, Guy correctly takes it to another level where she says that you need to do interprofessional collaborative clinical research to uh, appreciate the importance of interprofessional collaborative practice. So uh, I think we have answered the questions which were raised in the chat box.
Uh, anything uh, from our panelists before we uh, move ahead, closing the panel discussion? Anything from all our panelists? Yeah, again, I must say that uh, we thoroughly enjoyed being on this panel today. Uh, and uh, because uh, um, we uh, are very proud to say that we have been pioneering this in the Indian subcontinent. I will say Indian subcontinent, you know. And uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, my comrades, uh, Dr. Anand, Dr. Animesh, and uh, Dr. Gagan, Dr. Harihara. Uh, this camaraderie uh, did not just bloom out of our you know, intense desire to <laughs> make something out of it, never. It came actually <laughs> out of our desire. And of course, we have our budding people like Krishna, who is already an you know, office bearer in this and uh, has uh, shown the courage to actually take up some responsibility to even, uh, you know, uh, put interprofessional education and practice as an agenda of uh, your organization. We are very happy about it. And same things are happening, I must say, uh, pan-India, because the dentists uh, who were a part of our fellowship program have taken up this and uh, it's, it's endured into their curricula. Uh, Harihara is very much involved in bringing this in the fora of physical therapists. And... Uh, uh, I know your organization. I've, I've been working with the organization for the last almost just now, maybe more nearly 10 years, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a very proactive organization. And I know I, I see many of these names, uh, which are very familiar, senior people, you know, and uh, uh, you are here in spite of all your, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities. And this, and this time, uh, uh, you are here. We are very happy that you made it. And that shows your commitment. So I have a suggestion basically to uh, Isha uh, as, uh, uh, you know, my colleagues, I, I'm sure that they will endorse me. So if you have collaborative projects to do, like Dr. Gayatri was mentioning, uh, we will be happy to support you, you know, in uh, your collaborative academic ventures. Uh, and uh, we already have something in pipeline in terms of looking uh, some aspects. Uh, and uh, this we have talked with Dr. Krishna and Gagan is also aware about it uh, because uh, it's very important to create evidence in the Indian context. What works in Canada will not work here. What works in US will not work here. We need to have our own. So that is where we are working to have you know the context clearly defined and you know the hierarchy how strong it is in the indian context so but at the same time we all have a responsibility to take it forward so uh, to the president of isha and all the office bearers minakshi and many people whom i don't know here uh, my humble request is that we will be happy to take this forward as collaborative research ventures not only research this thing but also as we said in education what is it that we can offer at least if we can have a module where the students get introduced to teamwork communication skills uh, we already have a number of speech language pathologists for uh, uh, you know our uh, fellows uh, but at the same time uh, there are also these interprofessional, so we can't label uh, one profession. We will have uh, multiple professions uh, helping uh, to design such modules, to get involved in such research. And of course, uh, above all, as I told you, keeping community and uh, patients at the center. I mean, so we thoroughly enjoyed being here today. Thank you so much. And I will leave it to my uh, colleagues if they have any comments. Uh, to Dr. Anand. Uh, Dr. Gagan, just I think, yeah. just as a concluding sort of a uh, Anand, sir, remark, please. I think uh, my yes, request sir. to everyone who's a part of this and maybe who will, you're all going to be the torch bearers who will spread this message, be patient. Rome was not built in a day. This is not going to happen overnight. Be patient. There will be obstacles. There will be obstacles. If there are no obstacles, I'll be surprised. Okay, when, when, I, when I do audits for organizations, when organizations tells me that they don't have any infection, they don't have needle stick injuries, I always ask them joking, are you in hospital? So it is something like that. So there will be obstacles, but the key idea is to persevere with the idea because this is, a, this is an idea whose time has come. This is something that we must all sort of uh, work together. And again, I keep pointing out the patient is at the center. Let us, let us not forget that. And I think uh, if, 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 we, if we keep that uh, zeal in mind, I think that would be fantastic. A big, a big shout out to Isha and to all those who are there here. Uh, I think I think you have taken the first step in this in, in, the, in this journey, and I'm sure that you will all become the torch bearers. Because I've been looking at some of the comments that have come in the chat box. Thank you all. Fantastic, great work. Thank you, thank you, sir.
animesh sir and dr harihara uh, so uh, i no no i would just like to now. say thank you i think this is a great beginning and uh, congratulations to isha as well as dr krishna and uh, the team this is a very good beginning and what i was told earlier and when we were like preparing for this that there will be people from different uh, kind of backgrounds including i think the, the stakeholders like patients and and their relatives and others so i think this is a very good beginning and i'm sure that this will at least start the process of thinking and maybe some people will start to take it forward as well and dr siraj has already offered his support so i think thank you so much for this opportunity uh, we definitely look forward to going much beyond what we have just started thank you so much yeah thank you sir dr hari hara yeah from my side to uh, you know a bountiful thanks it was a great experience being on this panel and that too with our with our mentors um, as rightly said this is the beginning and uh, multiple professionals have already here so we have already stepped into this uh, ipcp physios yeah. uh, slp uh, community medicine people so Uh, so we already began the journey we are on board now the train has started moving hopefully we could able to reach the destination as desired and my best wishes and uh, support for this wonderful uh, activities thanks uh, uh, to the isha foundation and to you and dr krishna and very happy to see dr siraj dr anand and dr animesh you know though we missed that presence in uh, famer uh, classes we could able to see and thanks dr gagan for having me on this wonderful topic it's a great learning experience for me too thank you best wishes thank and good you. night Bye. thank you dr hari thank you thank you dr yeah. before uh, gagan conclude i just wanted before to before i conclude yes yeah before you conclude uh thanks dr siraj and his team for uh giving a open home welcome open home welcome for us to collaborate to initiate this practice uh i'm sure there are, as you rightly identified there are uh, uh, you know members in from academia there are clinicians and there are uh, even the patients who are there you know the stakeholders are there but the academicians and the clinicians who are there will approach us you know which will approach you in uh, developing this inter collaboration practice and make the quality of life of the patients much better and thank you very much for uh, the time and the you know the suggestions and the way ahead or how we can implement it uh, have been given thank you very much thank you thank you krishna sir so that put on the slide if this wonderful melody has to be enjoyed the harmony has to be enjoyed you know that each one in that orchestra is important and their role and when they work in harmony and sync with each other that's where the best music comes from and remember that if in words of henry ford if everyone is moving forward together then success takes care of itself and that with that message i would like to conclude this panel discussion and a very sincere thanks to all our eminent panelists siraj sir dr anand dr animesh dr hari hara krishna sir for agreeing to be a part of this uh, the panel and enlightening and setting the foundation so strong for uh, speech and hearing professionals and the diverse participants who attended this panel discussion about the concepts of interprofessional education and collaborative practice we are sure that uh, the fruits of this panel discussion are going to be very sweet and they'll become even ripened as the day progresses so thank you to all our panelists and as the moderator i would like to thank isha for giving me this opportunity to moderate this session on such an important topic and i'll always remain indebted for this opportunity so that's all from my side uh, here is gagan signing off and over to minakshi ma'am for the final conclusion thank you so much dr gagan it sounds a little strange calling you dr gagan because i've known you like for so many the thing but yes you're not only young you're so full of energy and knowledge and 
I would like to thank our eminent pa panelists, Dr. Siraj, Dr. Anand, Dr. Harihara, Dr. Animesh, Dr. Krishna. I'm so thankful to Dr. Krishna that he it was his idea to bring this panel, this topic on board, and we learned so much. And I would request uh, Dr. Our, uh, Naika sir to give some concluding remarks. Naika sir? I think... He must have uh, some issues with the connectivity. But, you know, I have said what, you know, it's, it's, it was really, really uh, very enlightening to see. Uh, we, you know, and this is the topic that everybody, when we are at the clinic, we think when a patient reaches us that it would have been so much better if we could have reached out to the professionals who were advising something because the message gets lost during the, you know, transition. And I love the way you guys, Every one of you uh, gave some so many practical tips to how to go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Very good night. Thank you.